Good morning. I'm just gonna Today is April 27th, 2017. It's 8:45, and the uh, conference committee on Senate on House File 890, uh, the Education Finance uh, Policy Omnibus Bill, uh, will come to order. Uh, the first thing on our agenda, members, is to move the adoption of the same and similars. You should have that in front of you. Uh, spreadsheet. Uh, the time and date stamp is 4.58 p.m. on April 26th. Uh, these are the sames and similars that both uh, Representative Loon and I have gone through as well as our staff and the nonpartisan staff. These are like technical, uh, grammatical uh, it, uh, differences between the provisions. And on the right, you will see the recommendation whether we're taking the House or the Senate language. Um, and I would look for a motion to adopt that. Representative Loon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I would move adoption of the same and similars uh, list dated uh, for our April 26, 4.58 p.m. that the uh, committee members have before them. Thank you. Um, all those in any discussion? All those in favor Madam signify Chair. by saying uh, represent or Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm just kind of looking at this and trying to figure out how to read the summary here. So it just for example, on e-learning days, are similar, um, oh, I see, recommendation is the house yes. language, got yes. it. Yes, so clear off to the right. Got it, Thank All you. right, wonderful. Any other comments, questions? Uh, seeing none, then all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion passes. Thank you, members. Today we thought we'd spend some of our time uh, with discussing some of the issues that there seem to be still some questions about in the committee. Uh, and one of those items that we had talked about was uh, dealing with the uh, crosswinds. There's great um, agreement on perhaps dissolving the bond between Perpich and crosswinds, but many questions remain about uh, what type. There are some options in going forward, and we thought it would be helpful if we had some of those uh, people from the administration um, who might be able to help us in answering some of the questions that were brought forward uh, earlier in our discussions. So, uh, and just to refresh, uh, the idea is uh, the Senate proposal is that uh, crosswinds be uh, examined uh, under our state surplus land language. Uh, the Department of Administration would follow current statute on that. And that brought forth some questions regarding um, the, the uh, how this would play out with, because of the issuance of bonds. And uh, with that, I would look for some testimony uh, first from the Department of Administration in uh, describing that state surplus land statute and how it might apply to Perpich. Mr. Waslaski, welcome to the committee. If you could introduce yourself for the tape, please. Madam Chair, members, uh, my name is Wayne Waslaski. I'm the Senior Director for Real Estate and Construction Services within the Department of Administration. Mr. Waslaski, um, would you, uh, for the, for all here, would you describe a little bit about the state surplus land uh, current statute that we have in place and how um, examining uh, crosswinds uh, under that statute um, might, uh, might play out? Madam Chair, members, uh, the existing statutory process has us first start with uh, a declaration from the agency that has custodial control of the property. Uh, in this case, it would be Perpich uh, would Center would have custodial control. They would uh, send a letter to the Commissioner of Administration say the property is no longer needed um, uh, for the current purposes. Um, and, and that then the Commissioner of Administration would uh, declare the property surplus, offer it to state agencies to see if there is another state use for the facility. Uh, if there is a state use, uh, then the property gets transferred through a transfer of custodial control from the uh, Perpich Center to whatever agency would uh, be taking uh, over the new, uh, f taking over the facility. Um, if no state agency is interested in the property or has a need for the property, then it gets offered to local units of government um, and it has to be sold at the fair market value. 
Uh, in this case, the property also has a, a secondary requirement. It's bond finance property, so that also triggers a requirement for it to be sold at fair market value and for MMB to uh, approve of that sale. Uh, so we would uh, contract with a licensed appraiser that have, would have experience with appraising these types of properties. Obviously, um, you have limited market information um, for this type of facility. It's not typical that you see this type of facility avail on, available on the market. Uh, but they would go through a process and try to find comparable <coughs> properties uh, and, and determine a uh, fair market value for the property, uh, appraised value. Um, then we send a notice to local units of government, to the county, to the city, school districts, and, and indicate the properties available and the minimum purchase price, as well as any other terms and conditions that, that would apply. Um, if there is a entity that submits uh, a bid and, that, and they're agreeing to the terms and conditions, then we review that with MMB, and if MMB is okay with us proceeding with the sale, then, then the transaction uh, is, is completed. If there's no local unit of government that's interested, <laughs> then we move on to put, offering the property for sale uh, on the open market. So it's, uh, we'd have to come up with marketing materials for, for this type of property, figure out how we're going to advertise uh, the property and market the property for sale. Uh, but again, the, it's a bid process at that point, and, and the minimum bid is the appraised value, um, because that again is the, uh, the established price. We cannot, under the existing statute, sell below that. We also can't sell below the appraised value when it's bond finance property. Um, so that, in essence, is, is the process that uh, is under existing law. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wasilowski. Um, how would the restrictions on use as the as an integration school, as it is now, how would that affect the potential transfer to another state agency? If if one, if it were deemed surplus and another state agency were interested. Madam Chair, members, if um, there was a requirement that you had to continue to operate the existing program, obviously the state agencies would, whatever state agency would take on that responsibility would have to have their own authority for operating that program as well as, as their funding to do so. Okay. Uh, so there would, no, there would not be any financial transaction then if, the, if it were deemed surplus state land and another state agency, there was use for it by another state agency. How does that work? Because I know you're, the department is pretty good at about assigning even uh, rent or lease to different state agencies, different costs. So how would the cost, how would the finance work on that? Madam Chair, members, it's, it's a transfer of custodial control, which is essentially, um, so if you take, for example, the buildings on the Capitol campus, those are under the custodial control of the Department of Administration, and the Department of Administration then charges the tenants of the building's rent. Um, depending on other state agencies have different methods, so in this case, let's, um, uh, we could use Department of Education. If it was transferred to Department of Education, um, they would then become responsible for the operating costs. Whatever agency has custodial control is responsible for operations and maintenance uh, of, of the facility, um, as well as operation of the program. So they, that financial responsibility goes with that, that transfer of custodial control. Okay. Um, and then uh, on the, that's kind of on the further down the road side of this uh, hypothetical scenario. Um, what about on the, uh, earlier aspects. So um, assume that uh, it has been deemed surplus state land, it's on the market uh, for a fair market price, uh, and there is uh, some, there's an amount of time there yeah. between where maybe some legislation would pass here, indicating something like that, and the time that it would actually be in the hands of a new owner. Yeah. And the question then would be, who is responsible for the maintenance, the upkeep, during the time that the property would be um, waiting to be sold or waiting to be purchased? Madam Chair, members, a uh, very important question. It's, it's uh, defined in statute that the entity that has custodial control of the property while a property is being sold is, is still responsible for operations and maintenance. So in this case, until the property is, is either transferred through a transfer of 
custodial control are actually sold, uh, Perfect Center for Arts Education would be responsible under existing statute. Okay. However, if it were transferred to the Department of Administration, then it would be under the Department of Administration or whomever it was transferred to <coughs> during this temporary time. Madam Chair, correct. Um, it, typically, you would we wouldn't do that unless there was legislation to that directed the transfer, and then of course the funding to handle operation and maintenance would have to uh, be part of that as well. Thank you. Yeah. Members, are there any other questions for uh, Mr. Mis Mr. Wislowski? Madam Chair. Yes, Representative Oh, Thank you, Madam mm -hmm. Chair and Mr. Wislowski. Thank you uh, for your testimony. I just wanted to confer, um, confirm something with you that I thought I understood. So if uh, Perpich were to, again, begin the process of saying they didn't need the building or didn't want the building to convey it to you, um, if it were to be continued to be operated while a, a perhaps a, a plans for, for sale of the building were to occur, um, would, uh, would the Department of Administration sort of uh, transfer responsibilities to the Department of Education if it were continued to operate as a school? Or would all that... Um, uh, transactions and sort of a contract if you would to operate the school would that uh, run through through your office or through the Department of Administration Madam Chair Representative Loon the existing statute wouldn't complete a transfer it, until there's actually um, a sale so the responsibility for operation of the program would stay with Perfect Center for Arts Education unless there's legislation that um, was passed that directed it otherwise um, so, if we just started the process following the existing statute, Perfect Center for Arts Education would continue to operate the program. We would continue to have our lease with Woodbury Leadership Academy, um, and um, it would b basically be status quo as far as the program and the operation of, of the facility until the whatever transaction happens to sell the facility is, is completed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, so Mr. Uh, Wozlowski, ba basically everything would continue as it currently is. Madam and, Chair, that's that's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, and then just to, Ms. Madam Chair, um, <coughs> follow up again on sort of the um, public purpose um, requirement under the statute. And so, um, if if there is not, say, a, a school district that steps forward to to purchase the building or something. Uh, another another public entity, another agency, if you will, that needed um, could could step forward um, to enter into discussions or negotiations with administration to to purchase the building, or would they actually purchase it, or would it just be conveyed to that other agency for another public use? Madam Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Loon, the uh, process. So, if it's a transfer to a state agency. Um, they would, uh, um, I want to make sure I get your question right. If you could restate that again on the... Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Wozlowski. So if, um, say, another uh, agency uh, had a use for the building, would they, would they uh, apply to administration or would it go through MMB to say they would like to use it for, for some public purpose uh, that they have identified a need. Um, I, I guess what happens in that case? Um, obviously, w right now we know it's being used as a school, but if it were to be used for some other public purpose, how would that process work exactly? Madam, Mr. Chair, yeah, Madam Chair, Representative Loom, thank you for the clarification. So the transfer of custodial control process, um, when it's first offered to local, uh, state agencies, they submit a, a indication of their intended use of the property to the Commissioner of Administration. We would review that with MMB to make sure that's uh, acceptable with because it's bond finance property. Uh, and if it is deemed accessible, then the, then the transfer. Uh, we also send a, a legislative notice um, of the intent to complete a transfer and get a recommendation uh, from legislative chairs. Um, I believe it's the finance chairs. Uh, that, that weigh in on that um, and then we are proceed with the, uh, the transfer of custodial control. So um, does that answer the question? 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you, Mr. Wozowski. That helps make it clear. Um, just one other question. Um, do you know if the lease that's currently in place, there's a charter school that is renting um, space at Crosswinds. Do you know if that's in place uh, for the 2017-18 school year and, and what the, the length of time of that lease arrangement is? Mr. Wasowski. Madam Chair, Representative Loon, there is a, a lease with Woodbury Le Leadership Academy. Uh, they lease uh, approximately, um, there's 67,000 square feet of space that, that they lease. Um, some of that's 48,000 of that is shared common space um, uh, with uh, crosswinds. The lease term uh, goes through July 31st of this year. Uh, we ha have had a letter from uh, attorney representing leadership uh, academy. They're very worried about um, the uncertainty around the next school year and, and they've uh, uh, asserted a claim that the, the lease amendment that was processed, uh, that they may challenge the validity of that, uh, that uh, extended the lease to July 31st, uh, claiming that they have an option to go through the next school year. Um, obviously, we disagree with that, that position. We think we have a, a, a valid amendment, but it certainly acknowledge the concerns that they have and the issues that they have with their families and kids on, on the uncertainty that's, that's out there for the next school year for them. Madam Chair. Yes, Rep. Uh, thank you. And Mr. Wozlowski, so right now the uh, Woodbury, I think Woodbury Leadership Academy does yep. not have a lease for the, for the fall school year to lease space at Crosswinds. Madam Chair, Representative, Representative Loon, that's correct. Uh, thank you, and uh, Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, Mr. Wozlowski, and so, and, and those lease arrangements uh, flow through you, through the Department of Administration, or do they originate with Perpich and then to you? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Loon, the lease transaction itself, the lease authority is through the Commissioner of Administration, so the lease is between the Commissioner of, of Administration and Woodbury Leadership Academy, but we work with the agency that has custodial control of the property. So it, it starts with Perpich, and once they're okay with us proceeding with the lease, then then we head in that direction. Uh, thank Absolutely. you. Uh, and one final question: and and is that is that the <coughs> the uh, procedure in all cases for uh, again a publicly owned building if part of it is to be leased that it all flows through the Department of Administration, those arrangements at some point? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Loom, that's correct. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, first, uh, Mr. <coughs> Arneson, I have a question regarding um, the restrictions on the current use. I think you might be the best person to answer that. Um, do we have restrictions on crosswinds at this moment that it be used as an integration school and what are those restrictions? Uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Anderson. Um, I do believe, uh, in addition, we have a uh, representative uh, in the audience from MB who, who may be able to answer better, but, but the building was last conveyed, uh, you'll remember, uh, to the Purpose School for, for use as an East Metro Integration School. So uh, that would be the, the restriction on the, the use of the building now. Um, and we may want to understand whether that restriction would continue or, or, or the, any particular transfer to a, another state agency under the authority that, that Mr. Waslowski described would still be subject to that uh, restriction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, are there any further uh, questions for Mr. Waslowski? regarding the Department of Administration or the state surplus land statute. Uh, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I apologize. I just can't help but put on my real estate brokerage and appraiser's hat for a moment. We'd like uh, to hear it, <laughs> Senator Weber. Um, can, going to the uh, situation in which it ceases to be used for school purposes and it's going to be marketed out on the open market, um, recognizing that the appraisal of that is, is not just an appraisal that gets done overnight um, because you're probably looking at repurposing that building and, and it, that's a whole a different ball game. Um, 
and also uh, the marketing time uh, probably is not a quick one. So in that context, is it, in light of the circumstances that have brought us to this point, is it reasonable to expect that the current occupant is going to be financially capable to maintain the maintenance uh, of that building during that holding period and during that marketing period? Uh, Senator Weber, that's a, a very good question. Uh, we will, we do know that uh, the current occupant is Crosswind School, which right. would not be operating there. But I think your question might be to the current um, owner, owner at this point, right. which would be the Perpich, Perpich Center for the Arts. Correct. And yes, so we might have someone from Perpich here who might want to address that. We'll hang on to that question. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to approach? Uh, Madam Chair, perhaps uh, 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 while um, Ms. Burke is coming down, if I could ask yeah. Mr. and uh, Mr. Wozlowski another question, just uh, Mr. Wozlowski, um, do you know what the what the capacity is of the Crosswind School or the building right now in terms of students and how many students are currently there? Is that something that uh, the Department of Administration keeps track of? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Lund, we do not okay. keep track of that. Thank you, and uh, all right, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, stay nearby, we may have more questions for you. Uh, please, uh, we'll answer this first question, I know we have some others coming up as well. Um, welcome to the committee, if you could uh, introduce yourself for the tape, please. And then probably address uh, uh, Rep uh, Senator Weber's question. Thank you, Madam Chair, <laughs> members of the committee. My name is Peg Burke, B-I-R-K. I am the interim executive director of Perpet Center for Arts and Education. I began on February 16th. Uh, we appreciate very much that this is on your agenda because of the urgency of crosswinds. And I will would have other things to say, but I'd like to answer your question. I think I can sum it up by saying Perpich has been subsidizing crosswinds with over a half a million dollars every year. Fifth, fiscal year 18 projections show that we would be subsidizing crosswinds at a million dollars. So this matter is urgent. We cannot afford to continue to operate crosswinds. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Thank you. Uh, um, for, Chair. Yes, Representative Luton. Um, thank you. If I could just do a follow up with Ms. Burke. And um, I think I know we had the opportunity to discuss this, and I think. Um, more to Senator Weber's question, I think, as a follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, I know that a lot of those costs have to do with um, special education, um, I believe, from um, conversations that, that you and I have had. Do you know what the cost of maintenance, um, for example, if the, if, the, if the building was conveyed to administration but Perpich was still responsible for sort of the upkeep uh, in maintenance of the building, the facility. Do you have any sense of what those costs would be? Madam Chair, Representative Loon, unfortunately I don't have those numbers at my fingertips. What I can tell you is that the annual budget for Crosswinds is $4.6 million and the cost of special education for students of 130 enrollment is uh, close to a half a million dollars a year. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Thank you. Any further questions for Ms. Burke while she's here? Thank you. Um, I think uh, Senator Pratt uh, had the next question. And just so members know, um, it, so if your question applies to that, we do have uh, someone from MMB here as well, the Assistant uh, Commissioner, who will be able to answer the questions regarding uh, MMB's um, look at the bond requirements and such. So that is coming. But Senator Pratt. Thank you. Well, uh, Madam Chair, my question is for Mr. Woleski. Um, as I took the note, we transfer, if, if the property is determined to be surplus, we transfer it to the state, we transfer it, we then look for local government and then we put it to the public. Are there any restrictions on local government? For example, must that local government have jurisdiction over that property or can a foreign local government come in and, and purchase property? Uh, so, for example, I think what we're looking at here is a potential sale to St. Paul Public Schools. However, the property is actually located in the Woodbury School District, if I understand. And can you talk about 
how you define local government and any restrictions on that. Mr. Wislowski. Madam Chair, uh, Senator, that's a, a very good, interesting question. So typically when we send out our notice under to local units of governments, it's those that are geographically in that jurisdiction. So we would send it to the, uh, the school districts uh, uh, in that area, uh, as well as Washington County and, and the city uh, would be the three entities. So typically, um, and I, but I'm not sure I'd, I'd need to review the statute to see if there would be a restriction for us uh, sending it to, I don't believe there would be a restriction, um, but I would need to review that uh, uh, if another school district was interested. Senator Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. So along that line, could you just look at any restrictions on uh, one form of government buying property in the jurisdiction of another? Where, where it has no jurisdiction. Mr. Wislowski. Uh, Madam Chair, will do. Thank yeah, you. We'll have to get back to you on Thank that. You. And uh, I'm having uh, council look, uh, say how do we define local government in that state surplus land statute? I do recall in Olmstead County, uh, a similar situation with state surplus land uh, that RCTC then was the ultimate uh, recipient of that. And that, you didn't mention uh, Minsky or Minnesota State uh, in your list of whom you would notify regarding those uh, local units of government. Madam Chair, they, um, those, those uh, University of Minnesota and Minsky get notified in the, uh, at the same time state agencies do. So they, okay. it, it actually is a transfer to them for uh, a dollar that uh, is occurring. Um, again, this is bond finance property, so that we'd have some restrictions on the use of the property, um, but it's, it's it's still that transfer sure. for dollars. Thank, thank you for that, and we'll get to the bond uh, you, uh, financed uh, pieces in a moment. Um, Ms. Butler, were you able to find anything in statute, reg or Bjorn? Uh, Mr. Anderson. I'm Chair, uh, just quickly, I think this is the relevant uh, section of code in 16B.282 paragraph Subdivision one, paragraph C begins, um, before offering surplus state-owned lands for public sale, the lands shall be first offered to the city, county, town, school district, or other public body, corporate or politic, in which the lands are situated for public purposes, and the lands may be sold for public purposes for not less than the appraised value of land. So I, I read that to mean that um, first, the, the property would have to be offered for sale to the county, city, or, or school district in this case, uh, in which the, the property is located first. Thank you. I think that uh, does answer um, our questions there. Um, any further discussion on, um, on this aspect of the crosswinds? All right, seeing none then. Thank you, Mr. Wislowski. Thank you. Um, if we could have our testifier from uh, MMB, I believe it's Assistant Commissioner Jennifer Hasmer. If you could um, describe for us a little bit uh, about uh, this um, bond financed entity and how um, changing ownership of that might, the bond uh, financing might affect the transfer of any uh, ownership. <coughs> Ms. Hasmer, please uh, introduce yourself for the tape. Welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jennifer Hasmer. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Debt Management at MMB. Um, so we're all starting from the same starting point. As we know, Crosswinds facility is state bond finance property. Approximately $20 million in state general obligation bonds were used to design, acquire, and construct the facility. Um, and bonds are still outstanding. Uh, we do not sell bonds on a project by project basis, but on a review of historical spending records, we estimate that approximately $6 million in GO bonds are still outstanding for this project. From that perspective, uh, any sale or conveyance of the property of the facility needs to follow the process laid out in the general obligation bond statute, which is 16A, 695. 
that is largely in line with the surplus land statute that the Department of Administration has described. It would require a determination that by the state that the property is no longer needed or usable for its intended purpose, would require a sale for fair market value as determined by an appraisal, um, and then the, the property would transfer for, for fair market value. Thank you. Uh, questions? And uh, yes, Sorry. Senator Pratt. So um, thank you, uh, Ms. Hasmer. So as we talk about the covenants <coughs> on the property and the bonded sale, what are the covenants that we're facing today? Ms. Hasmer. Madam Chair, Representative, the covenants are essentially a restriction on use of the property and a restriction on sale of the property. And each of those two categories would need to follow the, the process laid out in 16A695. Thank you, Ms. Hasmer. Madam uh, Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, and can you tell me what those covenants on sale are? Ms. Hasmer. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, uh, the covenants on sale are essentially the process that I walked through uh, that would be required determining that the property is no longer needed or usable, um, that the sale be for fair market value determined by an appraisal, any sale proceeds that come back to the state because there are bonds still outstanding for this project would come back to MMB and we would use those to pay down the bonds. Uh, Ms. Hasmer. Or do you have a further question along this line? Yeah, I Senator? do, Madam Chair. And so there's no there's no covenant on the future use of the property that would restrict who the buyers could be. Ms. Hasper. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, if the property is sold according to the bonding statute and the surplus land statute and it's sold for fair market value, then any future use restrictions will be relieved from the state's perspective. However, if the legislature conveys the property for something less than fair market value, then those use restrictions would continue. Thank you, Ms. Hasper. Very uh, important point. Um, we also have a question, um, and, and I think you've, uh, in a roundabout way, we, we have the answer, but we just want to be very clear about what type of vote uh, is required by the legislature to um, change the use or ownership of this bond finance property. So we're thinking, is it a three-fifths vote, a simple majority vote? If you could explain two things, what, what the vote requirement is, and then also, uh, should there be a sale? Just kind of walk through that step of the sale price, paying off the bonds, um, and kind of walk through that for the committee, if you could, please. Ms. Hasmer. So, could you repeat, uh, Madam Chair, could you repeat the first question? I was writing down the second oh, question. Sure. As, the first question yes. is, is a very simple one. It's yep. about what vote is required oh, right. by the legislature. Okay. Uh, three fifths vote is what we uh, have, of course, for bonding issues. This is um, not uh, releasing bonds, but it is a bond finance property. So, we want to be very clear on that question. Madam Chair, thank you very much for clarifying. Um, the vote requirement stems from constitutional principles that authorize the use of general obligation bonds to begin with to finance the, the project as was done in the early 2000s. Um, because the Constitution requires a three-fifths vote um, for authorizing the use of GO bonds, and because the purpose must be specifically identified by the legislature when passing the bonding bill by that three-fifths vote requirement, any change in the purpose that the legislature would like to see at that facility must also be ratified by a three-fifths vote by the legislature. Um, the one caveat would be if those fair market val value sale statutes are followed, um, there is not a, a three-fifths vote. There's not a, a constitutional change in purpose there because we are essentially taking that the, the bond designation away from that property. Um, if also, if the legislature seeks to convey the property to a specified new owner of the property, then that is also from MMB's perspective on a reading of the constitutional principles also should be subject to a three-fifths vote. So just to summarize briefly, the two areas where MMB would say a three-fifths vote would be required is if the owner is being changed by the legislature or if the purpose is being changed by the legislature. Thank you, and thank you for that uh, synopsis. So just to be clear, if it's a matter of paying off the bonds and then a new use, that is a simple majority vote. That is not the three-fifths vote because the bond proceeds are, the bonds are paid off. 
Madam Chair. Hester. Madam Chair, that's that's correct. Thank you. Um, any further, uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, you, you opened up an interesting train of thought, and I, if I could maybe have a a couple of potential follow-ups. Um, Ms. Hasmer, how much do we still have left on the bonds on this property? Ms. Hasmer. Madam Chair, Representative, our, our estimate based on spending records and matching those up with bonds that we sold historically, it's approximately $6 million that are outstanding. And, Senator Pratt. And thank you, Madam Chair. And the, the fair market value is considered the appraised value. What happens if the appraised value comes in under the value of the bonds? Ms. Hasmer. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative, if the fair market value is under the what is left on the bonds, the $6 million, then the proceeds, the sale proceeds would be used up to the amount collected. There would be no requirement to make up any shortfall. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so as you said, if the, if the property were sold at fair market value, the covenants would expire. It, does that include if the fair market value is below the bonded amount and also to convey that property at fair market value when there are still, if it doesn't cover the bonds, does it still require a, a three-fifths vote of the legislature? Ms. Hasmer. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, so long under federal tax principles and state law principles regarding the sale of property, so long as the property is sold at fair market value, that will relieve um, the property from any bonding restrictions, um, even if the amount is less than the bonds that are outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Hasmer. Uh, Representative Loon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Hasmer, I just wanted to have you repeat because I wasn't sure I heard you exactly correct or if my um, understanding is correct. So you said that if the owner is being changed by the legislature of the property, then a three-fifths vote is required. So we have had, um, I think this is the fourth school that was built with um, general obligation bonds by the state. Uh, operated by a, an integration district that then no longer wanted to operate schools and the, those schools were conveyed to school districts. Um, and so if Crosswinds, which is currently, was conveyed to Perpich, was conveyed to a school district uh, by the legislature, uh, is it that that would require a three-fifths vote? Is that correct? Ms. Hesper. Uh Madam Chair, Representative, if uh, the property is being conveyed to a known school district, then similar to how uh, Crosswinds was conveyed from the East Metro Integration District yeah. to Perpich in 2014, um, we took the position that, that that needed to be in the bonding bill in 2014 and that transfer was included in the 2014 bonding bill. Similarly, if the property is now going to be conveyed from the state back to a school district but for the same purpose, we would want to be legally consistent with what happened in 2014 and also require that to be subject to a three-fifths vote. Uh, Representative Lewin. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ms. Hasmer. Um, is that the position MMB has consistently taken throughout this legislative session in conversations with with legislators and staff? Ms. Hasmer. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, to my knowledge and belief, it is. There have been a lot of proposals that have been under consideration this session. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Ms. Hasmer, I think it would be helpful if a letter uh, clarifying that would be provided to uh, members of the conference committee. And I would request that that be done. Ms. Hasmer, we would look forward to that. And I think also in that letter include some of these other uh, discussion points that we've had here this morning. And also um, just to, um, I, I understand there's been four instances where uh, geo-financed um, properties were sold or were um, no longer needed, and two were sold at fair market value, and two were conveyed. Um, that, those are the notes that I have. Is, is that your recollection as well? Ms. Hesper. Madam Chair, uh, upon a review of files with the Department of Administration and MMB earlier this week, we did identify those four properties that you're referring to. Um, that, that is what we had identified during the time frame um, that was given to us to look in our files for what, what yes. bond finance property has been sold. Thank you. And then um, do you have any idea what the fair market value is of this property at this point? 
Madam Chair, I do not. That would be determined at a, by an appraisal. Yes, maybe we should ask Senator Weber. Have you been out there? <laughs> we'll hold. We'll hold off Can on I, that, Senator yeah, Weber. I, uh, no response, Madam Chair. <laughs> but um, I do think it's important uh, that we do get a sense of that, and um, and we will address. We'll find. Uh, we'll address that and, and get a fair market analysis uh, of that. So, um, members, are there any other questions or? comments uh, on this topic. Okay, I know we're running short on time. Um, uh, we, uh, we are running a, a tad short on time and I know that we have one other agenda item which is the Rural Community Technical uh, Education. And uh, Senator Weber, I'm wondering if you could describe a little bit um, your proposal uh, that is in the Senate bill. I don't believe there's a comparable House provision. And uh, but, but before uh, you do, uh, Senator Weber, I just want to uh, kind of s set the stage a little bit why, we, why, uh, why this is so important. Um, on your um, agendas today, members, uh, we printed it off in the same form that we printed off every Senate agenda for the session. And at the top box, it talks about our mission, focus on students, fund what works. And then the next paragraph talks about uh, the vision for how we get there. And it's not in this box, but there were a few areas that we identified that could really help us uh, get to making sure that um, all students are uh, receiving an opportunity for a great education that prepares them uh, for <laughs> jobs of tomorrow and also prepares uh, the workforce that we need. And we, we talked about one of those was early education, making sure kids enter kindergarten ready to learn. The second block we talked about was early literacy, making sure that kids are reading proficiently at the end of grade three, and this committee has talked about that as well. And we have talked about the early learning as well. Um, and then a third area that we talked about that would be so important is the career and tech education piece. And uh, Senator Weber is going to discuss a little bit about that. And um, later uh, in some of our talks, we'll probably talk about the fourth piece that was uh, part of our steps to getting to this um, high quality, making sure that all kids are ready for jobs of tomorrow, uh, really is to make sure that uh, kids, we get more dual enrollment and we encourage that. But so for right now, Senator Weber is gonna talk about the career and tech education uh, aspect of that. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was elected to this. Please, uh, thank you for coming, and we'll be sure to uh, <laughs> stick close. We might still have questions for you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was elected to the Senate in 2012, and, and shortly thereafter, I, I started to have uh, visits from my local business community as well as my local educators uh, concerning the issue of career and vocational training, and uh, and and the. The local business were concerned because we have really a serious lack of people in the in the building trades. You know whether we're talking actual construction, whether we're talking plumbing, electrician work, uh, this type of thing. Um, we had a series of meetings involving uh, educators from uh, the high schools in the area. We took a couple of tours to the Career Vocational Training Center. That uh, I only live 30 miles east of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and they actually built a separate school for that specific purpose for high school students over there and then obviously you know the the um, logistics for the greater Sioux Falls area are different than many of our rural areas are uh, but uh, it, it really does point to the importance of having this type of training available for our high school students out of the four major school districts and tuition spots for example in the Sioux Falls facility they have at this point right around a thousand students involved in 15 different vocational career training programs uh, we used to have that uh, in in my community. We had at one time three or four different vocational training programs through the high school, uh, and we actually co-opted with other schools in our our area uh, at that particular time. And then, quite frankly, it was the state of Minnesota that really made a shift in focus, um, really believing that. The sole purpose almost for high school was to prepare students for a four-year degree. And forgetting about the fact that not every student should be pursuing a four-year degree, nor do they need to, in order to have uh, a good career uh, and uh, ahead of them. 
shortly after I started having these meetings with my local educators, I was at a meeting where former Majority Leader Roger Moe spoke, and he was talking about education issues. And he made the statement, and I for, forever remember this, he said, my, one of my greatest disappointments of, as I look back uh, to my service here, was when I let the state of Minnesota walk away from career and vocational training. And remembering that, I went back, we worked out uh, uh, through a number of things, had a series, again, of meetings. In fact, Senator Weger came down at that time as chair of, of the Education Committee. Uh, and we had, uh, we had well over 100 people there that day from education, from Minsk, uh, you know, high schools, uh, business, uh, chambers of commerce, uh, talking about the importance of this. And so eventually, we put together a bill uh, with the help of the Southwest West Central Education Co-op. Uh, Basically, it was a pilot project in order to fund uh, the exploration of how do we bring this back? Because obviously, individual schools in rural Minnesota will not be able to financially afford to have separate programs like we once did. And uh, so the goal was for them to put together this group that would explore the possibility of cooperative <laughs> ventures that involve not only our local high schools, but involve Minsk and involve private business. And, uh, and bring them in to identify the needs that we have within the car communities in terms of career vocational needs and also how the school can help provide them and recognizing that we may not necessarily have a high school student fully trained by the time they, they leave high school, but we do have them well then on the path, number one, in terms of being able to identify a potential career and also where within the career or the vocational uh, two-year programs, whatever they need to do and in whatever industry, that they, they can then get into that and actually have a leg up on that education at that point. And, uh, and I want to thank uh, uh, Chair Nelson for including that uh, in the Senate proposal this year at, uh, for one and a half million each year for the biennium. And I know that she has plans for that beyond the biennium and I would turn it back to her to allow her to speak to that issue. Thank you, Senator Weber. Uh, so we know all of us in this room and, and, and parents and students all across our state realize today more than ever how important that career tech education is. And Senator Weber has done a wonderful job of explaining one example of um, how this need is being met. And I will say when I was a middle school teacher, we did have career in tech ed. Uh, and we did have uh, numbers of um, offerings that no longer exist, both in our middle schools and in our high schools. And so the pendulum has swung back a little bit. And uh, it's, it, it's important that uh, the state of Minnesota not only acknowledge that, but actually embrace that <clears throat> and realize how important it is that our kids are are getting the options uh, for go for career and tech ed. Um, we also know, as Senator Weber said, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, that our we don't necessarily have the structures in place anymore to support that like we did at one time. Um, there's an example in uh, Senator Weber's district uh, of something that is working, and there's an example in my district as well, and that is called CTEC, and that is a collaboration with the Rochester Public Schools, uh, RCTC, um, the businesses and the um, manufacturing and the Chamber of Commerce all coming together uh, to really pu put together this uh, CTEC opportunity for kids. And it is combined with concurrent or a PSEO <laughs> options as well. So the students are getting um, high school credit, college credit, they're earning stackable credentials. Uh, we, these are in several areas. There are program pathways for Health Science Career Center, Hospitality, Manufacturing, Construction, Information Technology, Agriculture, and, educa and Engineering. And all of these, uh, I think I, I can't recall how many um, different program pathways there are uh, in, in each of these areas. And the uh, community has come together and actually, uh, in this collaboration, actually built a building on the RCTC campus to facilitate this uh, career tech education. <coughs> and other communities nearby, other school districts nearby, are also uh, using this. And so we wanted, to, and the Senate 
Uh, Bill, we wanted to get started with this initiative that uh, Senator Weber uh, has described, but we know that this need exists throughout the state. Our workforce demands it. Our students demand it. Their <coughs> parents require it as well. Uh, you know, it's no uh, secret that uh, the crashing, crushing student debt, we have one of the highest uh, student debt levels in the nation. And uh, one of the ways we can dwell, uh, bring that down as well as helping provide the workforce we need, we also have this severe sh workforce shortage, is through this very, these very targeted career and tech ed type collaborations. But it's important that we get these out throughout the state, not just in Rochester, not just in uh, Senator Weber's district, but we want to be able to uh, have a structure in place going forward where we can encourage more uh, career and tech ed and these wonderful collaborations. So in the uh, second biennium, the funding in the Senate bill is $6 million uh, for uh, grants across uh, the state, uh, and it's geographically distributed as well. So um, that's really, I think, uh, a step forward in solving several critical issues that we have, have described. So I don't know if there's any uh, further questions on that or any comments. Uh, Representative Erickson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question probably would be for Senator Weber. And uh, I'm on R73 of Article 2 and R74 as well. Uh, this is an intriguing proposal that uh, really does interest me because like you, I have a very uh, uh, deep interest in ensuring that career and technical education are part of our uh, K-12 system. Uh, first of all, we might want to think as uh, policymakers of establishing a closer relationship between our technical colleges and K-12. As you recall, Senator Weber, uh, years ago, that was uh, before the uh, Minsku system it included the technical or the what we called community colleges uh, until that was combined. We were really linked, and so we might in future want to have those conversations. But my question would be uh, for what, in the first year there's the 1.5 million, so what would that be used in the first year <clears throat> to do? I see that there are on our uh, 74, some uh, startup costs, uh, where would this uh, equipment be placed? Would it be in the K-12 system? Would it be in the uh, cooperative area? Would it be a new? Could you just comment on, on some of the uh, provisions on R-74 that deal with uh, the, the grant uh, use? Rep uh, Senator Weber, would you like me to address that? Or oh, well, I can certainly start out yes. if you would like to yes. fill in, uh, Madam Chair. Thank You're you, right. Madam Chair and, and, and Representative Erickson. Uh, I think, you know, at this point in time, obviously the initial money will be spent on perhaps uh, uh, hiring uh, some uh, consultant uh, efforts to, okay, evaluate the different um, uh, programs that might be available. Also, uh, put on, pulling together the school districts and first to identify what we see as perhaps the major vocational needs for the for the uh, for the area. Uh, upon achieving that, I think then it's it's a question of how best do we meet those individual vocational needs. Number one, is it through um, is it through some of our uh, Minsku systems that are are in the area? Uh, is it may perhaps within a a particular high school that still has so the physical, basic physical structure for whether it's a building trades or, or some other type of vocational opportunity. And then to utilize that uh, money if needed to perhaps additional equipment uh, for, that, for that particular facility. Perhaps uh, there's a, an opportunity for a mobile type of classroom that could go around and visit different school districts within the area, in the region, uh, and perhaps it would be to help uh, in, in acquiring that equipment. Uh, or uh, in, in addition, uh, I think they would also use this as an effort to reach out uh, to the local business community, for example, to the, to the local plumbers who are having difficulty finding people. Um, 
can we access, we, it would be a public, sort of a public-private partnership at that point in time, whereby we may need to fund part of this, but then they contribute uh, to providing the necessary equipment and that type of thing. Uh, I know, for example, right now, uh, one of our local plumbers uh, told an individual if, if he would go to, to class, uh, they'd buy their entire set of tools just to help them get started. But, you know, part of the problem we've also encountered, if we can go into the Minsku system and some of the uh, career technical facilities, is, is uh, they've actually been looking at a declining enrollment in some instances while the needs for these people actually uh, has been accelerating, which is sort of a strange scenario. But I think part of that comes from the emphasis that we have within the education system placed on the four-year programs as opposed to um, sort of ignoring the two-year programs that are out there. And, and I know Senator Nelson feels that it has some things that she'd like to say to that at the issue as well, and I'll turn it back sure. to her. Um, uh, Representative Erickson, this is an important uh, question and you really uh, touched on something which is this greater collaboration really between our K-12 system and career and tech ed. And, oh, oh, and that's something I think this is a small step moving towards that uh, collaboration. Uh, regarding the grants process, um, if you'll look on uh, R-74, uh, you'll note uh, there's a, we specifically called out that private funding can be part of these collaborations as well. And indeed they should. Our businesses, our employers are um, crying for employees. And it is incumbent on them as well to participate in, in these initiatives. And so while this language is not, I don't believe, overly prescriptive, because we know that every part of the state is different in not only its career and tech ed needs, but also the resources that they have to meet those needs. So the um, this initiative is to start the to provide some seed funding to start those um, initiatives and those collaborations both between the um, community colleges and the business community and the employers. I can give you an example of SeaTech uh, in Rochester, for example. The uh, hospitality industry, uh, very important uh, to our community. Uh, certainly not enough workers, great worker shortage there. And so this SeaTech uh, uh, building uh, includes a, which looks to me like a very large uh, commercial kitchen with all of the newest uh, commercial kitchen pieces, the, the large stoves and all of those things. So we know it was not inexpensive, but that was the hospitality industry that came in and financed that equipment. Uh, result, there's also a, a lab, a veterinarian lab, a veterinary lab that is uh, in the SeaTech building again. And again, that's funded through uh, the individual uh, businesses uh, as well as the working with the community college. So I think for us to think one of the great things, in addition to the seed money getting started here, taking it statewide, is really uh, pushing forward these very necessary collaboratives that we need with all of the stakeholders uh, to get these type of really cutting edge uh, career and tech options throughout the state. And we also live, I think we can also take advantage of the, of the fact that uh, it's a, um, we live in a wonderful time where we have so many digital resources as well that uh, bring knowledge from all parts of the state uh, into a one spot and uh, we can access those those things as well. So I, um, I, again, it's, it's not the be all and the end all, it's the start. It's the start of the conversation to try and do a better job uh, providing students with opportunities for stackable um, credentials. So Madam Chair, do you see this as a pilot? Um, it's not listed as a pilot. We hope it's not a pilot, especially when you're talking about asking um, collaborators to invest their resources. It's a little hard to do that and ask them to do that if it's not, if it's a pilot, if it's a one-year pilot or something. Of course, we could say that all of our budget is a pilot because every year the legislature can come in and rearrange and reappropriate according to results or priorities that, that might change and you know we often do that. Uh, but this would be in session law, Madam Chair. This is in session law, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Ma Madam 
Yes, uh, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and, and Representative Erickson. I would also mention that, that on R91, it also indicates that the appropriation is available until 2022, the total appropriation, so of, of three, uh, three million dollars. And so they, they don't have to be in a, a rush to unnecessarily spend money, but rather to do it in a, in a practical and, and methodical method to ensure that uh, um, they do it correctly. So uh, I'll just address you, Senator yeah. Weber. So if we're not able to spend this kind of money uh, as requested here, uh, have you thought about um, more the public-private partnership to maybe um, a, a, as the seed money more than you know relying on on on, on state dollars M madam chair and and uh, representative erickson i think that our thought was in this that for us, I think to have a successful public-private partnership, I think they have to recognize that the state is committed to this, you know, because we have walked away from it before. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Weber, and, and, and thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm very intrigued with this. It sounds like a, a good program and much needed, and it's been you know, bantied about in my school district and area as well is a great need. I, can you remind me the amounts? It was 1.5 million the first year, and then yes, uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, go from memory, and then we'll have staff make okay. sure that uh, we've got that correct on the spreadsheet. Uh, I believe it's 1.5 uh, and 1.5, and then in the out years it's three, it's three and three, three million and three million, and okay. that is the a grant process to take it to other regions of the state. Okay, and Madam Chair, it, yes, it goes Bennett. until uh, 2022, you said, mm -hmm. is that correct? <coughs> yes, yes. Rep. Thank Bennett. You. Any further discussion on the career tech ed initiative? I appreciate the good discussion today on, on all of our items. And uh, we have met, uh, we've, um, Completed our agenda. I know the House is going into session, I think, at 10. I know we have, I believe, caucus at 10 and session at 11. So uh, with that, uh, seeing any other comments or questions, members just know that we're continuing to take all of the good ideas that we have in both of these bills and meld them into, uh, into a finer prod product. So with that, members, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Our next committee will uh, be chaired by Rep. Loon. Thank you. <laughs>